Well, it should work now. Yeah. Okay, <coughs> we continue with uh, another statement here. Uh, low and medium income countries will have a slower growth, but structural changes <coughs> may still contribute to a relatively strong growth. Uh, low and medium income countries. This means that they have a not very high GDP, gross domestic product per capita, uh, per head, the GDP is quite low. Structural changes. You can imagine a country with a rather <coughs> big population, uh, but where the distribution of the income within the country is very skewed towards a small group of people. So the distribution of income within the country is very, very biased towards, uh, let's say, a um, class of people, owners of uh, factories and infrastructure and things. And then you have a l large number of people with which are very poor. That is what is said here. So if you read the <coughs> documents from the World Bank, they are also not only concerned with, with economic growth as such, because we often relate such focus to the, to the World Bank, but they are also focused on equity or equality. <coughs> that one should have a policy that engages a larger fraction of the population in, in, uh, in, such, in such countries in productive activities. And that has to do with training. Education of people. Uh, it can have to do with uh, with political reforms, offering health care, and uh, and uh, you often you will have to start with the public sector to increase demand by boosting public sector activities. To start with that. And then <coughs> when, uh, when, let's say, certain types of public infrastructure is in order, and we're talking about very simple things here. We're talking about roads, talking about sewage, talking about water supply, schools, universities, uh, and so on, to get, let's say, the economy going to engage more people into productive activities. It's a big problem in, in, in many countries, this. So, uh, <coughs> and it's, it's the same here with, with uh, developing countries to amend extreme poverty. Uh, will have many, of course, positive human implications, but also it will have a very strong implication on exploiting the potential that is uh, that is inherent in in the country in terms of using the human capital better to increase when we talk about increasing the amount of human capital we are talking about a higher education level and <coughs> better possibilities for people to 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 work and to develop themselves because if you look at it, if you compare the capital base of a country, you can take roads, buildings, manufacturing uh, facilities and everything, but the largest proportion of capital is related to, to the citizens, to the human, human capital. And that is why this is important when we talk about we talk about international trade and, uh, and, and development, and how to 
to make this uh, to make a kind of a a more sustainable growth and to let's say to use to make use of uh, regions in the world which has a clear potential for b becoming much more prosperous than they are today and Africa is is one such uh, example and there are many others so <coughs> we are also when we talk about international trade and we talk about analyzing uh, development patterns in international trade uh, we also have to deal with risks and um, one major risk apart from political risks and things like that has to do with uh, with the prices of raw materials and oil prices energy prices is a very strong factor here so for for countries that are most vulnerable when it comes to to uh, to oil price fluctuations we could have as much as a 1% gdp decrease if the oil price increases with 10% and 10% is not much the fluctuations has been much greater than that as we shall see so uh, <coughs> so uh, countries which and what is said here is that some countries have very small gross domestic product and quite a lot of it is tied up against use of, uh, of oil. So they use quite a lot of their resources <coughs> on, on, on purchasing uh, crude oil for various purposes. We have this uh, interest rate uh, issue <coughs> which is not much of an issue these days because the, the interest rate is low. Historically it's very very low. Uh, I bought my house in it's a long time ago now 1986 and then around 1989 the government deregulated the, 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 the market for funds and loans in Norway so before that, the, the state had a quite uh, strong position as a regulator. But around 19, 19, 18, 1989, it was deregulated and left to the market. At the same time, they removed the possibility to, to get a tax exempt. As much you get some today as well, but at that time you get a much stronger tax exempt for for having loans and that was to, to stimulate people to buy houses and, uh, and so on. So the interest rate rose to, uh, I, I remember I paid 17% interest rate. And today it, uh, the interest rate is around four, I think. And, uh, and uh, if you translate this to, to nations, of course, if, if the price of capital increases, that will have a, also a very large impact on, on, the, on the activity level. Um, <coughs> this one is, uh, is, uh, is of, of great importance because, um, and that has to do with what I showed you on the last section. If you get this boom in China and also in a few other countries, to become too strong in terms of having balance towards a long-term sustainable amount of loans and things in the, in the national economy in, in these big countries, especially China. If this is not balanced, you can get a setback, a strong setback, and it can, uh, and it can uh, occur quite quite suddenly, from one year to another, you may get a crisis. And a crisis in, ch in, in China will have, will have consequences for international trade worldwide, worldwide because China is, is a kind of a manufacturing center in, in the worldwide these days. 
lot of manufacturing is done there, as you know. So what I'm trying to, to, to say is that it's, it's a very complex picture. And you need to, to take into consideration uh, a lot of them. Also, when, when you are going to do the business that you, this course is, is trying to train you a bit for, namely to do transport planning. It's less of an issue if you have, let's say, um, trucks and aircraft and uh, everything that is flexible. And if, if things go bad in one region, you could perhaps, if you are good at it, you could employ the, the, the vehicles and the aircraft in other regions and try to, to, uh, to amend the problems by, by moving your activity to another part of the world. But if you get a global downturn, it's not easy. And if you, get, if you are engaged in, um, in, let's say, capital investments, within the transport sector, building up warehouses, fixed infrastructure, ships, and everything that is, has a very high amount of fixed capital investments. You need really to take this into consideration, the, the, the prospects and the forecasts for, uh, for, for these types of, uh, of relationships <coughs> to be able to hedge against uh, problems that can be become evident in the uh, in the let's say near future uh, or not too distant future. Yeah, just a short view of the of the <coughs> world GDP per capita. It's from 2008, and you see that. Uh, that these these areas are uh, are the um, the areas Europe. You have the U.S. You have Australia. You have Japan, with a high <coughs> GDP per capita of some uh, 300 uh, or let's say 10 to 20 thousand dollars per year on average and up. Whereas these these areas are less le than less prosperous. China is moving upwards in this uh, picture. Uh, I'm not too sure about the numbers now, but, but, they, but, but the Chinese economy is kind of in a situation where they are facing cost increases because of the supply curve. And that supply curve has to do with labor. So the wages in China has grown quite strongly over the last 10 years. So not 10 years, perhaps just five years, it has started to grow. So you mentioned outsourcing uh, earlier on. The companies in China are now looking for possibilities in, in, uh, in neighboring countries where the, where the shades are darker, to, let's say, to move production to to even lower cost countries in the, in the region to, to uh, avoid the, the increasing labor costs. So this is dynamic. Just to show you the crude oil price, the refiner acquisition costs in, uh, in dollars per barrel. A barrel is around is around 100 liters or something like that. So we see that this is from uh, 2007 and up to 2012. And this is the crunch in 2009, where the oil prices went down with almost $100 per barrel. And that has some consequences. <coughs> of course, this happened because of this, um, this inward shift that I showed you. When the global economy contracted, Mm. 
you get the price decrease, quantity decrease. And the statistics can look something like this. Not good for the oil producers. Not too good for a country like this one, produces oil. But there are certain equilibria, equilibrium mechanisms at work here. Because uh, a lot of oil is used in, uh, in manufacturing. So products, manufacturing goods are becoming cheaper. And that will, you can use the same uh, scheme to illustrate this. If, if uh, a production factor becomes cheaper, the supply curve shifts downwards. And then the growth starts, the growth is starting to catch up again. Because then, when the supply is shifting downwards, you get a higher quantity of demand for, for other goods, like whatever manufactured good that uses this type of uh, factors uh, in, 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 the, in the production. And then you see as then demand is starting to to recover again, we we get a higher or an increase than in, in the oil prices. And when you have a small uh, leveling off in uh, in 2011 in February, but the increase was caused by external factors. When an oil producing country is, uh, is uh, has some uh, pr internal problems, the civil war and things like that, the oil price will react to that. You see here some incidents that takes place. So when OPEC. <coughs> The oil, <coughs> the organization of petroleum exporting countries, when they decrease their production target, meaning that they produce, produce less oil, that happened here because the oil price was so low. So they started to 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 reduce the supply. And then we see that things are starting to to increase again. You see here also. Uh, <coughs> in addition to the credit crunch, we had some some disturbances, which uh, also reduced uh, or uh, contributed to to this development. But in isolation, a Gulf hurricane, which affects oil production in a certain area, should contribute to an increase in oil price. So perhaps the credit crunch in itself would have made the oil price go even further or even faster down if it hadn't been for this incident here, which caused a bit of delay in the, in the steep reduction in oil prices. So some of these risks can be controlled, whereas others are totally out of control of the of the planners, so so you just have to to live with them and and uh, and try to to hedge hedge against them, and you can do that in various ways. By, for instance, uh, enter into long-term uh, agreements with with uh, with suppliers of oil, and uh, and you pay a premium for that. Of course, uh, it's just the same as the market for electricity in this country, where you can choose as a household to just follow the market, and then you live with all the fluctuations like this. Or you can, uh, you can um, buy a fixed price for el electricity through the, through the whole year, where the price is fixed, <coughs> but it's higher and you pay, uh, than, than the average costs that you would have to pay if you just follow the market through the year. 
but you, you pay a risk premium or an insurance premium. You can do the same with oil. Um, from recovery to expansion, uh, <coughs> this is uh, again um, trends from the 2007-2008 uh, and, and, and onwards. Uh, this is taken from, from these economic outlooks um, published by the World Bank. And you see here some more specific information is, is, uh, is presented, uh, which is relevant when, when we're going to, to do this type of planning that we are dealing with in this course. See some, some differences. <coughs> uh, and um, the, main, the main uncertainty in East Asia is, uh, is connected to, of course, the development in the, in the Chinese economy. The largest problems is still in Sub-Saharan Africa, <coughs> except South Africa, which is, is not, they are doing not, not too bad, but, but other countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, are is, uh, they are struggling. And uh, they have this uh, exposure to, to fluctuations in oil price, and they are uh, also struggling with political issues, lack of distributive policies, uh, potential again for increasing the, the human capital, and, and it's really a, a large potential. But uh, but uh, there are there are prob problems um, there. World trade, just some uh, some figures. Um, this is just uh, some uh, some economies again. China has a large surplus, trade surplus. We are talking about trade surplus and trade deficit. And this is not a course in macroeconomics, but I just want to, to make you think a bit about why does China has a large trade surplus with the US. It's because they are net exporters to the US. China doesn't purchase much from back from the US, but they export to them. So the trade goes from China to the US. Whereas other countries, let's say not too far from China, and also as time now goes by, including Africa, because China is, is extracting quite a lot of raw materials from Africa. They have a deficit with other developing countries because they are net importers from other developing countries. So they import, uh, let's say, production factors like iron ore to make steel, oil, uh, and what have you as, as, as import factors, which they uh, source from countries in the, in the surrounding area. They process them, manufacture, and then sell it back to, to the US and, uh, and also Europe. They have a surplus with Europe as well, because China is a net exporter to Europe. So when you read about surpluses and deficits, you could, for the sake of simplicity, think in terms of, at least when it comes to relationships like this, like raw materials flowing in, making a deficit, and finished goods exported out to rich customers in, uh, in, the, in the Western world, causing a surplus. Yeah, this is just to show you some, some forecasts on the seaborne trade, because uh, as we shall see later on, seaborne trade is uh, there. The, the real st and the strong volumes in international trade is 
taking place by, by seaborne trade. We'll talk about international trade here. So this is divided into different, uh, different segments, and we see that uh, the container uh, trade is suspected to have, or is ex expected to have the, the largest uh, growth, whereas the tanker business is, on average, considered to have the, the lowest growth. And uh, the reasons for this <coughs> is that the container trade has a more high value good, they, they transport more hi high value goods than the, let's say, the dry bulk, for instance, which dry bulk is, uh, is iron ore, grain, and, and, uh, and uh, things like that, whereas container tons is carrying manufactured goods, which has a high, higher value per ton than the dry bulk. General cargo is also <coughs> more of a high value uh, transport uh, business. And then they have the tanker, <coughs> which is due to the fact that the energy efficiency in manufacturing is expected to increase. So that uh, the oil consumption in the years to come and within this, this uh, rather modest growth is also expectations about carbon taxes, energy efficiency, and hence a slightly reduced pressure on the demand for fossil, fossil fuels, simply. So this is the reason why you have these different, or at least the rough reasons for why you have these different, uh, different uh, development patterns in terms of growth per year, which is on the, on the um, vertical axis. Very briefly, uh, just to show you the, the China effect in, uh, <coughs> in, term, in terms of export. This point is the base, sort of the baseline here. This is where everything is zero. This is in, in the year 2000. And then you have the development in, uh, in percent along this, uh, or this is the year, and, and this is the percent market share with 2000 as a baseline. So we see that the market share for China, measured here, it, uh, has, has, uh, has grown steadily and is now of around 50%. So the strong performer in this picture is is uh, is uh, is China? This is Eastern Asia, excluding China. This is developing countries, and this is the developed countries, with a s fairly unchanged share of exports. So China is obviously the big player in this in this picture, and it still is. Even if this is these numbers are slightly old, we have. Not that strong growth anymore, but uh, but the share is is uh, of uh, fifty to sixty percent is still still valid for China. This is a big big trader, so I'll not go through this. Just for your, you can have that and, and then read it for yourself. But you have the big traders here. Um, <coughs> with China of around six percent, United States of around ten percent, and you have Japan, and you have Europe. If you add Europe together, you get a quite strong, strong uh, share here. And then you have a lot of smaller countries. This one <coughs> is, is of interest. And uh, I have tried my best to find newer numbers and more disaggregated numbers. But I haven't, I haven't made it. But this is 
could actually be a topic for a, for a master thesis, not within logistics perhaps, but within economics, to try to construct such trade matri matrices for different types of commodities. <coughs> for what we see here, <coughs> this is value. And this is the matrix where you have the destination, the trade flows to, along this axis, and the, tra uh, and the trade fl flows from, from this axis. So we see that from Europe to Africa is it quite it it is a bit of of trade going from Europe to Africa. But um, <coughs> from Africa to Europe is not not that much. From Europe to Europe, the in European trade is of a, of a quite high value, short distances and so on. Whereas you have the Asia Asia, the, the, the domestic uh, the, or the intra Asian trade of this magnitude and so on. So you see that you can actually map the trade flows between countries. And this is on, a, on an aggregated level, but if you break it down on different commodities, you could get quite interesting and, and relevant information out of that. In terms of value and the way the flows are, uh, are actually going. Yeah. Manufactured goods are dominating the world trade flows. Um, Poor, na poor nations are more uh, dealing with, with raw material, whereas the richer nations are dealing with, uh, with more finished goods, higher value goods. Um, OPEC nations and uh, Norway are dealing with, um, are still rich countries, uh, at least uh, most of them are quite rich, but they are dealing much with raw materials. Norway is dealing with fish, oil and gas, and that are sort of very important parts of, uh, of uh, the products that are, are uh, traded from Norway. So you have, you have an kind of an intra-industry trade between the big, the big, uh, <coughs> the big four, or, it at uh, or we could say the big five, with, with China included here. So they they try they change products of a fairly similar type in uh, manufactured products, whereas in the north south trade, let's say from Afri Africa to Europe, uh, Latin America to to Canada the U S, you have a kind of a mismatch because you have raw materials flowing in one direction and manufactured goods flowing in another di direction. So the north south trade seems to be of a, what we call a hexaroline type. It means that it's a trade of dissimilar good between dissimilar nations, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's different from the from the intra-industry trade. I'll come back to that uh, towards the end of the lecture, actually, very briefly. What that means. Now, just a very short uh, comen uh, comment upon transport in this picture before we move on to the theoretical part, which we'll deal with in the last, last hour, last section. Um, Drivers behind freight transport demand is uh, we have now talked very much about this factor, which is the global economy and the division of labor globally, uh, <coughs> which has something to do with industrial location. How does the pattern look like? Is the pattern is it likely to change over the years? 
I mentioned that China or Chinese factories are now moving production to other countries in the area, which has to do with this point. Um, <coughs> spatial structure goes together with this one and with that one. Um, where does uh, production take place? Uh, how is the, is the um, trade structure designed? Talked a bit about hubs in the inter introductory lecture. We'll come back to that uh, later on in the in the course. But spatial structure has to do with the industry location, but also with how how the transport flows are are organized from the transportation perspective. International agreement. International agreement affects this as well. can give you one example. Um, Japanese car makers, they have started up, they have established themselves in Europe with uh, factories. Honda, Toyota, they are making some of their more upmarket cars in Europe. Why is that, do you think? Avoiding customs, EU regulations, and so on. It's beneficial for them to be to produce inside Europe because of regulations connected to to the EU. As one example, just in time practices and warehousing. Um, that has to do with uh, focused on, and then we are on to more traditional logistics supply chain management with a focus on decreased inventories, reduce slack, reduce waste in the production lines. We'll come back to that a bit later on. More shipments, smaller shipments in, uh, in, in many cases, faster modes. You have certain um, trade-off between speed and costs, which is interesting. Um, you have a market structure within the, the, the freight transport business with um, strategic alliances and, uh, and vertical integration, which can cause um, monopolized structures, but also nice, uh, nice consequences in terms of being able to exploit economies of scale in production. We talked a bit that, uh, about that on the first lecture. Transport, uh, transportability of pro products, package, packaging and recycling, uh, which is also um, a part of this, uh, this uh, freight transport demand picture. Regulation, deregulation. Uh, which has to do with customs, regulations, trade unions, and so on. Try to increase competition, which has been successful in some parts of the transport industry, road transport industry in particular. But it is, uh, it is not without problems. <coughs> but the picture when it comes to the big shipping lines, the big container, uh, container industry, container sh shipping industry is more mixed with a, with a tendency of concentration, market concentration, which could drive the prices up. Fuel ta costs, taxes and subsidies is important. Um, and the taxation structure that is heavily discussed these days is uh, carbon taxes on emissions from the transport industry. It's a quite strong focus on that. And I think we will see changes in the years to come with more, more uh, focus on, um, on taxes that should correct for the social costs of emission, emissions. 
For domestic road transport, it's not too bad. I mean, the, the, the fuel taxes are covering the, the emission costs. But on the international tra uh, transport, uh, for the international transport, it's not, it's not uh, a, f a cost coverage. They are exempted from uh, carbon taxes, more or less, as we speak now. Infrastructure and congestion. <coughs> Here we are more on the, let's say, the local level. And with local level, I mean specific cities, specific parts of the transport network which may have problems with capacity. And hence, the costs are, 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 are perhaps <coughs> too high as, as compared to a situation with a more optimal uh, capacity allocation in terms of infrastructure capacity. Uh, we have safety and environmental policies, which is uh, also some types of regulations for instance, there is a maximum speed on heavy goods vehicles, which affects uh, the number of units that are needed for, uh, for transporting a given amount of, uh, of goods and so on. And you have technology, where containerization, containerization was the big shift in, in, uh, in technology when it comes to international transportation. You have documentation, you have information flow technology and things which uh, this is also contributing here. Just before we break, uh, just it's just for your information. It's a, it's a scale showing prices in US dollars per kilo of transported goods, average numbers. Just to show you this, the span here, where air, car air cargo is the most expensive one, and down to, <coughs> to water transport, sea transport, with one cent per kilo, which is a, I mean, it's really much less than, than, than air transport. But still, uh, air transport can be preferred. Uh, of course, we talk about lightweight, high value goods. Goes, goes without saying. And we'll discuss this more in detail when we deal about when we talk about the specific transport modes so this is uh, this is it before we continue with uh, the theory the next section break now <coughs>